Hi, Nick. Hey, Henrik. Good talk. How are you doing? We're finally I'm live. We're finally live. We got here. Finally live. 600 people signed up for this event. So uh, Amazing. I think they might have very high expectations of us. Yeah. They, they may. It will be fun. They may. Hopefully they will. Hopefully yes. they will. So, uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for joining uh, today. This is the fourth episode of uh, Behind the Future. So for the ones that haven't seen the previous episodes, uh, my name is Henrik Holt. I work as an account executive at Ardoc uh, and is fortunate enough to be, uh, to be allowed to sit down with fantastic people like yourself, Nick, to talk more about IT, strategy, enterprise architecture, and uh, hopefully learn more. So, of course, the, the topic of today's episode is we're going to dive into the, the kind of the current state of enterprise architecture, what are some of the challenges that a lot of architects and enterprise architecture functions are facing uh, today? Uh, and then we're going to try to take a look at how design thinking can kind of bridge the gap for what EA functions are facing when it comes to bridging the gap between business and IT uh, and deliver better solutions for their business stakeholders internally, but also for their end customers. So, uh, and all, of course, this started with, with the article that you wrote uh, some time back as well, mm -hmm. touching about this concept. Um, so I've been waiting for a long time to, to finally do this with you and uh, I look forward to it. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this as well, uh, Henrik, a lot. Thanks for having yeah. me today. Real pleasure. Of course, of course, hopefully not the last one as well. Hope so. um, and just a disclaimer for today, I have my dog under the table. So if you see that I suddenly try to do some activities here, it's just to kind of get, uh, get the control of my dog. I get uh, it. And, then, uh, and then also, uh, which I think is going to be, be interesting for today as well, is also to learn more about your experience within enterprise architecture. Yep. Uh, and if there are any questions throughout this session, feel free to just write them in the chat, uh, write them down, and we will make sure that we try to address them. If not, we will follow up with uh, further, uh, further information as well. So as a starting point, Nick, could you kind of give us a quick introduction to yourself and uh, why are we having this conversation today? Yes, of course. So where to start? Maybe a start to start a bit back in my career when I started in IT. I think it's around uh, 22, 23 years ago. I started as an SAP trainee in a, in a very famous Dutch company called uh, Royal Philips in the consumer electronics area. And then I moved up quickly, uh, let's say, in the consulting area. Um, I think I did my first real consulting job in 2004, 2005. And then I spent a lot of time uh, with a company called KPMG, one of the big four advisors, where I had several roles, um, some technical roles, uh, more in IT architecture, also doing a bit of work in software engineering and uh, software engineering operating models, as well as strategy. And then it ended up with having uh, uh, multiple roles within, uh, let's say, the enterprise architecture space, also the enterprise design space, as I like to call it. And that's where I got the virus, uh, Henrik. Um, since then, I have been doing a lot of things uh, more or less related to that topic of enterprise architecture, which can be very strategic and tactical as well. Uh, but I also made my own business around it. So um, together with a, a couple of lovely people, I started up uh, a company in 2014, which was basically centered at or focused at uh, doing enterprise architecture consulting. Um, and since then, uh, we moved up uh, to be a company now these days with uh, around 180 people across the globe uh, called Digital Innovation. That's the company uh, that we have. Uh, and we do uh, multiple things. Uh, it can be very strategic, can be very um, operational. So we also develop software. We help to um, uh, develop next-gen companies as well, really from a business point of view or business strategy point of view. Yeah. Uh, but we drew it during all of our engagements and all of our work, we, we, we would like, uh, we like to use enterprise architecture as the glue between business and IT. Yeah. And kind of with your expertise and, and experience as well, like in enterprise design and enterprise architecture, when you kind of first, uh, kind of was, was taken by the virus to, to use the word correctly, uh, kind of what was your first impression of, of architecture? How was architecture placed in organizations typically at that time when you also were working with uh, KPMG as well? Or, um, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, the thing is when you work for a, for a large consulting firm like KPMG, you, you always uh, work for large companies as well, right? So all of the clients are, are big, big clients, big logos. Companies like the Philipses and the Shell and the, uh, you know, big retail brands and also banks and a lot of uh, other companies from the finance industry. And in that time, I mean, 15 years ago, uh, almost, um, enterprise architecture was still very young, right? And there was a lot of... 
uh, noise about a lot of a lot of fuss about architecture as a as a business uh, instrument or a business practice. But actually, what happened is that at that time there were so many problems with IT. You know, a lot of companies struggled with legacy transformations, and there was a whole you know the dot com bubble was still over there. So they had to speed up um, a lot in in you know revamping themselves. Uh, basically. Enterprise architecture, but also IT architecture, was seen as the as the silver bullet solution to to transform. But the thing was, enterprise architecture was, and it still is, I think, it was governed as a finance function, right? So um, a lot of the people that I met during those engagements, enterprise architects, business architects, uh, they didn't have a real um, mandate or a real role in terms of design and architecture across the enterprise. But they were basically in a in a vertical or within a silo. Uh, a lot of the times they reported to a CFO or to a guy or a girl that reported to the CFO. Mm -hmm. And since then, uh, honestly, and that is also the topic of today, I think, or at least one of the the, the important or the key elements of today, um, I don't think a lot has been changed since then. So it's still a very ivory tower kind of function, as I see it, uh, which is a which is a pity because there's a lot of value to be uh, to be taken from uh, from enterprise architecture as a, as an instrument or as a as a practice. Yeah, and it's it's very interesting, kind of when you said that you started out there, right? It was placed under the CFO function as well, and we mm -hmm. we we kind of know that a CFO is is focused on other things than, for example, the CTO or a chief innovation officer, just as an example. Mm -hmm. Like they're looking to build new products, new processes of kind of how we can take this company forward. While CFO is more focused on the costs and how can we keep them down. Yeah. So, and, and also kind of placing that within IT, how do you think that has been challenging a kind of EA's position within organizations as well, where there's more focus around how do we keep the costs uh, low, and whereas we kind of see more and more organizations now are investing heavily in their enterprise architecture functions to actually drive new solutions for the organization and kind of new competitive advantages? Well, first of all, it really depends on the the you know on the specific company uh, where we are talking about EA right so it can really differ I see a lot of innovative things happening around architecture in general with let's say you know highly digital highly innovative companies they don't even call it enterprise architecture anymore but it's more in functions like innovation or even product development uh, which is which is amazing but what happens in let's say companies that have been out there for a while, you know, older companies is that they have a high level of governance, right? They are really regulated. They have, they have a very uh, rigid form of, uh, of governance. Uh, and there you end up with, you know, building lists of things and tables and matrices, uh, creating overviews, basically serving the needs of other people or other departments that need to do cost cutting, right? In the end, it's really about money. Um, so companies that actually tell you that it that it is about creating value, right? Um, the best thing that you can ask is, at that point, yeah, but what is creating value, right? Can you tell me something about to that company? Can you tell me something about how EA or architecture is supposed to add elements to the top line growth, right? How can we help as an enterprise architect or as a business designer, or however you would like to call it, to make the company grow through innovation or through you know, enabling change, um, navigating through through times of change. Whereas, um, you know, and that will be an interesting conversation. I don't think a lot of companies have an answer to that. You know, no. another thing that is also typical is that since uh, basically when I started about 20 years ago, if you now Google or if, or if you search on the internet for uh, uh, enterprise architect jobs and you, you browse through that list, you see a lot of enterprise architect ABC jobs, right? So yeah. IT enterprise architect, business enterprise architect, data enterprise architect, even governance or risks ent enterprise architect. And it's really a struggle for a lot of companies to connect, let's say, the enterprise element of that job, which is about the business, which is about the company, which is about the strategy, to something that they call architecture. But very often without having a clue about what architecture or you know holistic design actually is. Yeah. So I think that if you if you start working for a company or if you are an, an architect or an enterprise architect working for, let's say, a more conventional company that have a lot of focus on, let's say, bottom line efficiency and cost cutting and, you know, operational excellence, then doing innovation through enterprise architecture will be a, a big struggle, will be a big struggle. I don't think it will uh, happen often. 
Yeah. And you mentioned kind of that ivory tower mentality as well. And this is something that frequently comes up and in, in, in kind of in the companies and organizations that we work with as well. Like kind mm -hmm. of what is your what is your experience with this kind of looking at it from an ivory tower mentality and what you mentioned in the article as well, kind of first of all like there's hundreds of frameworks right and there's a lot of different frameworks some are good and it's very difficult to tailor them to the specific needs and organizations mm -hmm. so what are some of the mistakes that you've been seeing uh, for a lot of enterprise architecture functions and then of course coming from an it lens but then trying to build that bridge over to business yeah that's a good question well ivory tower well it, it's a bit of a silly uh, definition, right? But what I mean with that is people that are far away from, from the actual uh, issues that are going on and that need to be solved, uh, for instance, by doing architecture. That's what I, what I mean with it. I think what is happening actually is that um, in, 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 a, in a mission to compensate or to build new organizational elements to, let's say, deal with new forms of complexity, uh, a lot of organizations come up with new functions, right? Uh, and they say, hey, this this team or this function or this this role will tackle this new set of challenges that we have that we haven't seen before. Yeah. Um, and what then is happening is that while those organizations are being built, um, and while that organization progresses in in building up the, this new organization, the people, the actual people that are working in those teams and and also the let's say the customers, you know, the people in the organization that should be helped by this function more and more they get apart from each other, right? Um, and what I think if, for instance, if you look at a designer, a graphical designer or a user interface designer or somebody that designs products, the key element in what helps them to solve problems is the fact that they are super close uh, to the actual client or to the user, as I like to call it, right? And if you look at enterprise architecture, actually any architecture practice in general, um, I think it's it is essential uh, that regardless the the matters that you that you are working with or the, let's say the you know the challenge the kind of challenges that you have to uh, that you have to try to tackle staying close to the actual user or to the actual underlying concern is key to be successful mm -hmm. the, the thing is a lot of companies that now see enterprise or have seen enterprise architecture as the silver bullet um, kind of um, you know solution they are run by people that followed mbas yeah. Right. That's a linear approach. That's a focus on finance. That's a focus on, you know, risk management that is around being compliant and regulated um, and pulling in people that should be able to fill out this enterprise architecture job. And but by telling them in the same time that they need to look, that they need to put a lot of effort on regulating stuff, having the police pad on right, or the police hat on being the stage gate, the stage gatekeeper will really carve out the for me, at least, the essential, um, you know, the essential en enabling uh, element of this function, which is about creation, innovation, and solving real user problems. Yeah. So, and this is kind of uh, kind of chicken or the egg kind of question as well. But where do you start? Kind of how do you get that executive sponsor as well? Because of course you can say, you know, this is uh, this is our objectives and for how we can support. Uh, kind of support the overall strategy of the organization, support the business, mm -hmm. but then also kind of where do we start? Because you also mm -hmm. need to kind of build that trust and credibility internally. So how can architects, or if we don't need to use the word architect either, kind of how can change managers, for example, how can they how can they leverage this this storytelling internally? Yeah. Again, a good question, Hendrik. Thanks for that. Thank you. Um, I've done yeah. my research. Like I haven't yeah, taken uh, very good. as many as many other Norwegians. I haven't taken one and a half <laughs> months uh, of holiday as we as we love to do. The long Norwegian <laughs> holidays. Yeah. Yes. Well, I think to, to come to your question, I think um, regardless, again, regardless the, the the specific challenges that you have to tackle, or also uh, regardless the um, the industry or the sector that you are working in. In the end, it's about people, right? Systems don't talk with each other. Uh, businesses don't talk with each other. Processes don't talk with each other. People talk with each other. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things that you need to think about um, when, you know, when exploring the, the best way to start up, let's say a change process, right? Where enterprise architecture always is a part of or could be a part of, but also a lot of other things like you know, people that, that have to deal with communication and with marketing and even engineers and strategists. I think it's really about the why question. Why do we want to do ABC? 
Why is it that we want to migrate system A to something else? Or why is it that we want to, um, you know, buy another company? Or why do we want to be in a certain market? I think people um, can't work without having a frame of mind, right? A perspective, a horizon delivered by an answer to this why question. That is really the context around why people do this. But the point is that a lot of people, also enterprise architects, are really afraid to ask this why question. Mm -hmm. Because what happens if you ask the why question to, let's say, an executive board or to a board of directors or you know, to the executive people that basically um, call the shots, is that I think eight out of 10 times they get angry about this because they don't have a correct answer to this because they have the same question. So I think it all starts with giving at least a kind of a direction to the why question. Why is it that we want to do this project or this initiative or, or, this, uh, or this transformation? And then the what follows. And what basically is about what do we need to build? What do we need to change in order to, to come to this, you know, to, to, to deliver upon that goal? Yep. And what happens, and only after the what, the what question, you can start thinking about the how, right? Basically what happens in, let's say, um, contemporary uh, business is that people always start with the how. Right? They build huge programs, they augment existing projects, they invest in external consultants, all to do uh, execution upon a program plan. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. a lot of time there is no what defined, what is it that we should be delivering uh, besides these timelines and these deadlines, but what is the content that we, the product that we need to deliver, right? Or the, or the, you know, the, the, the matter that we need to deliver. And even more, so if we have delivered it then, is it really adding value to our why question, why we have started this? So actually, if you think about if you want to design a product, a tangible product for somebody, right? And you ask a designer um, or you give a designer your, uh, your definition of the product that you want to use. I'm pretty sure that a good designer, the first sentence or the first question that you will have um, from this designer specialist or this design specialist is what, why do you want it to function it like this? Or what is the you know what is the purpose of the product that you that you need to have? Yeah. So I think in fact I, I, I'm, I'm long story short I think this miscommunication around the why topic it's caused by the fact that there is a lot of fear in corporates in corporates right to ask nasty questions to ask um, fundamental questions and that leads people to stick in an ivory tower and get more and more away from the topic and from each other throughout the organization. Yeah. Yeah, the, the reason why I was kind of uh, laughing a little bit to myself as well is, of course, I was thinking about kind of Simon Sinek, right? Like he's, he wrote his book, like Start With Why. And yeah. I think even though I don't know if he has a bachelor's degree or a, a master's degree in enterprise architecture or, or design thinking, but he's very spot on when it comes to kind of asking those questions. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that transparency as well, like we're, often down, it's kind of broken down into silos because different departments speak different languages and focus on different things. And that's also why kind of you, you mentioned this in your article as well, like the smart goals, you know, the OKRs and how you actually set goals, attainable goals that is relevant for more people than just your department. Yep. So but kind of before we jump into design thinking in, from an architecture lens, uh, kind of with uh, the, the illustrations that we have as well, when you kind of look at these organizations uh, and what kind of executive sponsors have been very focused on, what are some of the traits of the clients that you've been working with, the organizations that you've been working with that are actually succeeding? Like, what are some of the things that you're seeing with the organizations that are doing it well? Well, of course, it, it is not, uh, it, it, I don't have any academic proof for what I'm, what I'm about to say, right? But, but it's just like things that I see happening and, and, and my, my perceptions from either clients that are very successful and also clients that are a little bit less successful. I, I have seen very... I have seen companies being very successful in, in implementing, let's call it EA jobs or enterprise design jobs, right? For now, let's call it enterprise architecture jobs by people that don't know anything about IT, that don't know anything about business strategy, but that know a lot about innovation and building up uh, organizations for growth, hmm. right? People that come from a completely other direction that have been in business in certain you know, in certain functions uh, for a lot of years and then move up the chain and end up in an, you know, in an CEO position, uh, CEO or CTO or CDO position. A lot of them come from marketing, right? Yeah. Um, which is a very specific trait, of course, uh, or they come from 
also areas that are much more related to people, like you know HR domains, uh, and they succeed in building up um, organizations that are really connected, uh, connected in the sense of purpose, yep. right? And purpose is required to drive um, the let's say the the life cycle of an organization and. Uh, as a team going towards, um, you know, the collective goals of a company. And then all the rest becomes much more simple. Of course, you need to be able to connect across the organization to develop certain products or to develop digital platforms or to develop new ways of working or to implement a strategy into a new market, right? It's about yeah. teams. It's about building teams. And I, I do sense, and again, I don't have any proof or any collateral um, uh, uh, for what I'm going to say now is I see a lot of conventional companies that are led by conventional executives coming from finance areas or from purely strategic areas. Uh, they have a hard time in building up this new type of organizations, right? So what, are, what, although a couple of them, you know, they invent concepts like the company uh, next door, where they basically pull off a new brand out of their existing organization and really allow this organization to re you know, to redesign itself, to revamp itself, re-engineer itself. I, I think it's really needed then uh, at that point in time that these kind of more disruptive approaches are created to to reinvent yourself as a company. Mm -hmm. Also, then, maybe just, yeah. sorry, Hendrik, maybe just to end this. No worries. You know, I think it's a real struggle, you know, also talking about the next item will be about enterprise um, or uh, using um, design thinking for enterprise architecture. I think you can use any innovative method or you can uh, you know uh, invent any other cool way of working but it's all about context it will not work if the organization that you want to implement it in uh, is not ready is not able to fill out the prerequisites and you know has the conditions in place to be successful with any kind of approach right so that's like a, a, ca a big caveat for everything uh, innovative in this space yeah, exactly. And I was just going to say this before we go to the design thinking phase, but that is kind of that is what I've been experiencing as well. Like when we've been working with CIOs, CTOs, kind of executive sponsors that are kind of making the shots and kind of leading the change within organizations, kind of I think I think this, I see the same. Like it is the CTOs or the kind of CXOs that are asking the questions: Why? You know, mm -hmm. why are we doing this? And then also always having the people in mind when making implementations of new projects, kind of how does this serve our employees? How does that make their work day easier? Kind of how does this make our, our customers uh, work and kind of a life easier as well? Like how does this, how is this valuable for our end client that wants that yep. will be using our products and, and services? Um, and then kind of looking at it from design thinking from an EA lens as, as we have now, and kind of looking at traits of successful organizations as well. Mm -hmm. So of course we have the typical three stages of kind of inform, we have the idea phase and we have the implementation. So in your article as well, can you, the EDA phase, how to generate ideas from the organization uh, as well, kind of the implementation phase is, is much the same in design thinking. But step number one, you had some changes to when it comes to kind of informing or kind of inspiration, as it's called in, in the design thinking. So yeah. can, you, can you kind of take us through your thoughts on the design thinking model from an enterprise architecture? Let's... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So I, I, I have... Um model that, that we could share here uh, that, that would basically help us to, to define and understand the different steps, but I can start the narrative a bit if you want. So yeah. basically the, uh, there are three, you know, as you also mentioned, there are three big phases that I see in, in a uh, design thinking approach or a design thinking process for enterprise architecture. Threefold, first of all, an informed phase, then an ideate, ideate phase and an implementation phase that are all based on divergent and convergent thinking, right? And that is the, that is the big uh, linking ping to, let's say, design thinking. Um, the fact that you uh, allow yourself and your users and your customers to, you know, think without boundaries in the beginning, but you can only think without, you know, explore solutions if you have a clear definition of the problem. So the first thing that you need to do before you can extend, you know, on your thinking and brainstorm ideas is that you have that you need to have a real clear definition of the problem or the challenge that you or the opportunity right it's not always a negative thing that we want to do it can also be about creation of things that needs to be clearly defined so first of all you need to start in this informed phase in an in a, in an uh, in an activity which is about understanding the context and the purpose and actually that is um redefining or a translation of this why question right so 
what is the surroundings of this thing that we need to tackle exactly. and what is the purpose just imagine that, that we succeed what will it deliver right now even this point already will be a big struggle for a lot of uh, enterprise it data you know all of these uh, type of enterprise architects because mm -hmm. They are a lot of the times they are just confronted with questions like, hey, help us to design this new CRM system or help us to roll out this new SAP uh, migration, right? Mm -hmm. They are not involved in the decision making. Hence my remark that if you are not allowed to be, you know, at least uh, part of this beginning of this whole process, then, it, then you can invent any model that will be very difficult. But just imagine, you know, that yeah. the conditions are right. You can help as an enterprise architect to have a more clear definition of the context and the purpose, this why question, right? Yeah. Then secondly, that's the second step in inform. You need to define, create a list, create an overview of the people, systems, participants, partners, actors that are involved in this, right? So who is involved in the landscape of this? Uh, and of course, you can you can use rakis or, you know, uh, you can also create personas if you want to work with uh, with customer journeys or whatever it is. But you need to have a clear appreciation of who are the people and the systems and the act actors that are involved in this in this playing field. And also, what are the key objectives? You know, what what does it mean for for them? What what is in it for them? If it works, imagine that that we have a solution for this. What will it bring to them? And it, it's not always positive, right? It can also be like if we are able to automate processes or if we can automate work, then it will mean that, uh, you know, that there will be a shift in their work focus. That's also something that you need to compensate then in your project to make it successful, right? You can't go away from it. But that's something that you then see and that you basically tackle. And then the last phase here in this inform um, area or in this inform phase is that you create viewpoints and criteria. So the viewpoint is that's really persona based. Uh, basically putting everything together, connecting the dots. Um, actually, it's about creating realities, multi-realities, different realities around a single topic. We launch a system, we do a project, we, we, uh, we step into a new market or we launch a new product. Around that given element, that purpose, there will be different viewpoints, financial perspective, people perspective, um, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, then we have the ideate phase, which is really a design thinking approach. If you have a clear definition, then you can come up with solutions, prototypes, right? And the cool thing is, Hendrik, I, I, I do my best now to pull in a lot of IT terms, but we are not talking about technology, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about technology. It can be process, yeah. it can be people, it can be anything. And then, of course, you have to test it again with those users that you have uh, listed in the beginning and that you know, the, the, you know their viewpoints. And then it's about implementation. And this is always a struggle as an enterprise architect. This is also linking back to the poll that we launched yeah. uh, earlier this week, right? Um, do you as an enterprise architect or as an architect, do you want to be involved in the implementation? I think yes, at least in the first round of this, right? Because you are responsible for the key designs that feed this project or this set of projects. And it's only you that can safeguard um, the success of this in the beginning. Yeah. And then in the end, you have to launch it and... Uh, and launching for me means making very sure that everything that you have promised by implementing this product will be delivered, or if not, that you have a list of things that you can, um, you know, that you can browse, that you have as a repository, that you can address later on, like a backlog mm -hmm. of things or a parking lot of things. Yeah. So it, it's I know you know, and I can talk for hours about this. There's a lot of details. You know, you have loops, and there are cool templates that you can use for this. But actually, don't forget, it's really a communication tool taken from the older conventional design thinking model from IDEO, um, mm -hmm. which can be very successful also for an architect. Yeah. And then, of course, I think this is really interesting as well. And I, hopefully, we can set up more sessions around this. Because as you mentioned, like there's so many ways, kind of so many paths we can explore this as well. Mm -hmm. But kind of to summarize on, on your point there, and I think... That is very spot on with what we are experiencing as well, kind of looking at how architects, especially very often at least, become kind of roles to extinguishing short time fires, solving mm -hmm. ad hoc questions and projects that are on the side, but then not really being involved from the start. Mm -hmm. And I think to be able to become those strategic advisors for the business, kind of you need to be, at least you need to understand what's happening on the front, kind of on the front there, yep. kind of how this is impacting the organization. So, kind of as the last thing, then, what what are any resources or kind of books 
kind of uh, videos, whatever it might be that has been valuable for you throughout your career, but then also specifically talking about design thinking, enterprise architecture and, and so forth. Yeah. Well, I have a couple of tips and tricks to, um, to share. Um, I think my biggest advice is to uh, enable yourself to step into, um, um, let's say, areas of business or even other companies that, that you are unaware about. Yeah. Talk with people really outside of your comfort zone or outside of your, uh, you know, your practice area and listen how they solve things. For instance, uh, a couple of years ago, I talked with, um, with a nurse in a, in, a, in a Belgian hospital and she explained to me uh, how they were dealing um, with, uh, you know, patient onboarding and making f- uh, people feel comfortable uh, while they were pulling them to a lot of, you know, technology driven elements. Like you have to log into a portal and you have to reserve your bed and you have to make sure that you get the right medicine and you have to, you know, do all of these authentications and so on. And what was really surprising to me was that this this nurse who didn't know anything about IT could explain a lot of people processes and also the systems around it, you know, the bigger organizational system in a very simple way. And it was excellent. So what I got from that conversation was, um, you know, talking and listening to people outside of your known area, but then reflecting back on your job as an architect can really give a lot of uh, energy at least and, and makes you thinking. In terms of, you know, if we if we if we really have to do a talk about frameworks and and you know uh, methods, which uh, yeah. which is always the case with within enterprise <laughs> architecture, yeah. I think it's really worthwhile to have a look at. Um, I'm not selling uh, for the company, by the way, but I just <laughs> I just lo- love the guys to to have a look at IDO.org. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, these are the guys that basically I don't know if they invented design thinking, but at least they coined it. Mm-hmm. And they have a lot of resources also specified for specific, um, you know, industries and sectors that are all about user-driven exploration and design thinking based methods. So there's a, there's a plentitude of resources on, the, on their websites that you can really learn. You can take free classes. And then, of course, the challenge is, is you know, once you have read it uh, and once you have understood it, then the question is, are you able to, to, to apply some of these elements to your working methods and to who you are? Mm-hmm you know, in, 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 uh, in your professional life or also maybe your, your personal life. And then yeah. maybe as a last thing, Henrik, I've been thinking about the book um, that I really would like to um, uh, or ask people to read. Um, it's, it's a book called the, the Design of Everyday Things from Don Norman. Yeah. And actually, Don Norman, is, he's a usability engineer, really well known for everything related to uh, usability design and product design. But in this book, The Design of Everyday Things, he manages to build up a kind of a framework or a model that helps you to tell whether something functions right, is functioning right, right? And it can be from a teapot to a new kitchen, to a car, to a software program. He establishes a kind of set of criteria around what is good design and what is a working model. Things like um, the necessity of having a conceptual model around the product that you deliver, that you know by looking at it, how it will function. So there's a lot of things that, that you can read in, the, in this book, which are very interesting. And again, I think very applicable to, um, to our work, or our profession as an, as an architect. Yeah. But again, Henrik, and I'm just restating it. All of this will not work if you don't have the frame, the liberty, the understanding, the context uh, to be able to do this and to actually apply this in your work. Uh, yeah. if that is not enabled by the company that you work for. Yeah. I think those are great reflections and uh, famous last words, or not famous last words, but it's at least going to be famous words, I would, uh, I would hope. So, uh, of course, we have now been uh, doing this session for 34 minutes. We're a little bit over time, but Sorry, I just no. want to ask if there's any questions from the ones that are uh, seeing, uh, kind of watching us today. Are there any questions with regards to design thinking and how that can be applied into enterprise architecture? Um, if there's no questions now, we will also make sure that we follow up with the resources that uh, Nick was talking about now, both the book in itself, but then also the companies that are kind of leveraging design thinking in their day-to-day, uh, day-to-day space. So if there's, no, if there's not any questions, we will give it a kind of a couple of seconds to see if anyone is uh, willing to take a step outside of the comfort zone <laughs> and uh, deliver a question. Let's see. No? There's no uh, no questions, it seems. 
Uh, but Nick, again, uh, appreciate you sitting down with me uh, for this session. Uh, hopefully it's not going to be the last. And then, of course, we have another webinar coming up uh, shortly where Nick and also more people from Ardoc is going to talk about how to kind of make better, uh, better digital decisions in your uh, digital transformation journey, which I think is going to be interesting, which mm -hmm. is going to be on Tuesday, the 24th of August. Correct. Of course, we will also add, uh, add more information in the event page as well, so people can uh, see if it's interesting. Perfect. Great to have you here, Nick. Thanks a lot for having me, Henrik. It was a joy. It was a joy. Looking forward to the next time. Me too. Bye, Henrik. Bye. Bye.